week's episode of Hidden People, I am here with uh, Mikhail Zolian, and we are sitting uh, in Lovers Park, one of the prettiest parks, one of the few parks in Yerevan, at a cafe called Achachur. Uh, Mikhail, we invited you to be part of our program because you have been an active, engaged, young citizen uh, of Armenia, of the processes taking place in Armenia. Um, you obviously, like most of our guests on Hidden People, have uh, an extensive uh, background in education. You are actually a PhD candidate in history and um, on the Gharapakh conflict, which is something that, uh, that is part of our lives on a daily basis almost. But besides that, you've studied at Yerevan State University, you did your master's at Central European U University in Budapest. Um, I don't want to talk about all of the titles and degrees that you have. Uh, I want to talk to you today about the fact that uh, we are living at a time in Armenia of change, hopefully. Um, we've seen a lot of protests that have taken place in the past summer. Um, some of them have been successful, some are still striving to be successful. Um, this past summer we had the bus fare hikes that went from 100 to 150 to and we saw hundreds if not thousands of young people taking to the streets. How do you feel when you see those kids protesting, demanding their rights? Uh, well, it, it's, it's hard to explain. I mean, somehow uh in the West, people are still talking about the 60s, how things were happening in the 60s. And uh, in a way, we are still in the 60s. We didn't have the 60s when the 60s were there because it was the Soviet Union. Of course, we had something which uh, in a way was similar, but um, we didn't really have this kind of the youthful protest which changed the society. And today, uh, it's not, of course, all the Armenia, it's all the, you know, the former Soviet Union, maybe the Middle East, of course, in a very different way. But somehow we are uh, going through the change which has happened somewhere else 40 years ago. And on the one hand, it's uh, depressing that we're 40 years behind. And uh, on the other hand, it's uh, you feel that you know something important is happening right now, and you can contribute to it. And uh, as uh, you know, it, it might sound too pathetic in a way. <laughs> But, uh, but, you know, somehow you are part of that, that, that change that is happening and uh, everything that you do is important in a way that maybe people of my age in Western Europe or in America, they don't really feel this importance of the stuff that is happening to them because, you know, the major things happened before them. You know, they, they, they received already this society. I mean, of course, there are problems, there are issues, but uh, there has been a major change. So they are already feeling that, you know, it, they everything is more or less fine, but on the they've other hand, they reap the benefits. Yeah, they reap the, the benefits, the, the, and yet the, the, there are some things which are not. Also, you know, here it's very black and white. You know, you say this is right, this is wrong. It's very easy to find your place. Uh, there, everything is much more complicated. And uh, I would argue that, you know, while we put ourselves in a black and white, you know, boxes, it isn't black and white. I mean, I, I would argue that the processes are very complex. And sometimes because we put ourselves in, in you know, either or positions, that's why perhaps we don't move forward because we fail to see that there's a gray area there. Well, I agree, but what, what I mean by black and white is rather, you know, about your personal position. So, you know, you're when, either for or you're so, against. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it's, it's very easy. Either you're part of the system or not. While in the West, you know, you may think you're not part of the system and that you're a part of the system and then, uh, you know, it's, it's much more complicated than that. Here, of course, when you, it comes to assessing the reality, it's not black and white. It's actually one of the problems that we have this black and white thinking. Uh, but when it comes to, you know, finding your place there, uh, it's easy. It's, it's much easier than probably is, you know, in a developed country. Uh, I have a question which may sound a little naive, but I'm going to ask it. Past two, three months in Yerevan, specifically in Yerevan, uh, the movements, uh, the activism, uh, the, the, you know, it reminded me of a time, because I'm much older than you, uh, even though I wasn't in Armenia uh, in the late 80s, but we were very closely watching what was taking place in the country, uh, the Gharapag movement, how, you know, hundreds of thousands of people took to the streets uh, at a time when we thought it was absolutely impossible for such thing to happen. And then I saw the kids on the streets this past summer, 
And they were the children, they were the children of the people who were on the streets 23, 24, 25 years ago. And I, I, I found it very profound that the, the, the next generation was picking up the torch finally after two decades of, you know, we did have moments of, uh, of, of illumination, but I sense at this time something, something different is happening. Um, do you see that parallel or am I just people like me just really hoping? <laughs> Well, maybe you're a bit too optimistic in a sense that in the late 80s, there were not hundreds of people, but, uh, you know, thousands, hundreds of thousands, you know, like the biggest rally, it's still people say that it was a million people. I don't yeah. know if that's true or not, but uh, there were people standing, I saw the photos, you know, from Matanadaran to the end of Mashtos Avenue. Right. And uh, I, I was a kid that time, but, you know, I was, uh, my parents were actively involved and they took me to all these rallies and I knew what was happening. And when I, I, I got a bit older, it was already early 90s, but I was keeping a diary where I was writing everything that happened in Karabakh, you know, in internal politics. So I was very, as a kid, I was very, you know, other kids, uh, they play video games and things like that. Our generation, we didn't have that, but we had this movement happening and it was very inspiring but also there was a very strong disappointment after that and I think many people of my generation they are very disappointed maybe those who are younger than me they're not so disappointed so in this rally in this protest that are happening now I see some people my age but I see a lot more people younger than me. that's right and uh, I'm very glad about that but also I would say that you know this kind of tradition it never really stopped so it's just that now we have uh, Facebook, we have internet uh, news, we have uh, you know something like Civilitas, which never existed before because it was either television or newspaper. Right. You know? So now it's just these movements they get more covered. But in the 90s there were movements. There was in the early you know about 10 years ago there was this movement Skcela, which right of course it, it's I remember, all, it yeah. started. And uh, I think that they they were pretty much the you know, uh, if there had been Facebook at that time, we would have all <laughs> known about it much more That's because right, they yeah. were very efficient in organizing this kind of protest and also they used very non kind of not straightforward methods. Non-traditional you know, methods. Yeah, I mean, they were not, uh, they were very creative. Unfortunately, there was no Facebook and... Uh, <laughs> yeah, social media has really impacted our lives uh, tremendously. Um, Mikhail, for you, I, um, Again, you, you teach at two different universities. You're, <clears throat> you also work at the Yerevan Press Club. You're a political analyst, obviously a specialist on the Gharapal conflict. Um, for you, for Mikhail, what is, what is it that, that makes you passionate? What is, it, what is the one thing that you would, maybe one thing, maybe a hundred things, I don't know, but what are the, the issues that are the most important for you today in Armenia? Well, uh, to me, you know, a lot of things are very important, but I think after all, when you dig into some problems that we have, eventually you come to the problem of Artagacht. You know, the, the word uh, emigration, it doesn't really have yeah. this kind of emotional... Yeah. yeah, I mean, Artaga, when you say Artagacht, this Armenian word, it has a stronger meaning, you know, than emigration or migration. So I think you always come to that. and. Uh, it's destroying society in many ways that we don't, I mean, one thing is obvious, you know, that there are less people, but also society is becoming more fragmented because of that, because every person, uh, it's not just, you know, a number. This is a person who has social links, you know, there are people gathered around him or her, so when this person leaves, it means that uh, also links are broken between other people who were linked through this person. And it's, I would say that this is what bothers me most. And I suspect many of your friends and your contemporaries, uh, you know, I had a I had an acquaintance a few months ago who took out his phone and he said, I can show you the numbers of all those people who are no longer in Armenia. And he goes, nobody's left from my network, my social circle of friends anymore. Well, I, I, I would say I'm more lucky, but also maybe... <laughs> You know, it's. Uh, or you hang out with the kind of people who want to stay. Yeah, and fight. Maybe I hang out with other people who want to stay. Or, but yeah, that's you know, a lot of my friends are not around. Uh, they live somewhere else, and um, it's it's hard for them as well. I mean, it's it's not a land of milk and honey over there. So, but I, I think the problem is that uh, yes, things are not so good here, but they're not so bad either. 
But there is this kind of mentality that, you know, by leaving you can solve all your personal right. problems. And, and sometimes people leave because they have no other choice. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes people leave, uh, which, which is probably what happened to most of my friends, they never really left because they wanted to leave for good, but, you know, they got a job or they went to study and then just things somehow uh, happened in a way that they're still there, but they want to come back. So that's one thing. But also there is this kind of mentality that I see in people and, you know, just if you've taken taxis in Yerevan and you talk to taxi Many drivers, <laughs> uh, you see, you know, this is somehow uh, kind of the answer to all their problems. You know, they got stopped by, you got stopped by the traffic police, let's leave Armenia. I don't know, yeah. your neighbor is... The tax is, department, yeah. he came after you, let's yeah. leave Armenia. Yeah, yeah. You know, even I, not, you know, just your neighbor is loud at night, yeah, rather than go and knock on his door and tell him to shut up. Uh, this is not a country I'm leaving, you know, so yeah. that, that's what makes me... But what, the, you know, uh, we can talk certainly much longer about this. Um, why is it, you know, I, sometimes I think we're like professional nomads. We're like constantly moving. Those who are here want to leave. Those who are outside in the diaspora think and dream about coming and yet they don't. Um, why is it that, I don't even want to say this, but you know, just to say it out loud makes me cringe. But why is it sometimes that we don't want to stay and fight. I, I is it because the problems are too big? No, I wouldn't say that. I mean, problems are big. In, I mean, one thing is that Armenia is really small. Yeah. And, it, you know, uh, everybody half knows of its, everybody. Yeah, half of its neighbors are hostile. So, you know, sometimes you just, you could, psychologically, it's understood. You know, you can get tired of you know, roaming the same streets. So, and you can't, you, basically, it's, you know, if, if you get tired of Yerevan, you know, there's no other place you can go because there are no jobs. You know, also, also because it's too centralized. So the jobs are in Yerevan and nowhere else. It, you know, uh, that's that's also quite uh, quite an issue. But uh, I think the root of the problem is that we still have some kind of, you know, uh, old medieval understanding of the nation. You know, the nation is defined by, you know, your cul not even culture, but you know, some very specific things like your religion. You know, the food you eat you know, the way you behave in the family, while modern nations are defined by other things, you know. So we somehow have the illusion that we can keep being Armenian even if we leave Armenia. Yeah. Well, maybe the person who left Armenia will still... You know, but not their children But not their children and grandchildren. Right. Also, we have the example of the kind of, you know, what, what people call traditional diaspora. But what we forget, because they remained Armenian for a long time, even though in these communities you have the young a generation often they don't speak Armenian and you know they're not uh, they don't feel as strongly Armenian as their fathers but in this case these people didn't choose to leave Armenia they were forced to leave Armenia so they had a stronger incentive to keep their uh, Armenian I agree identity. with you 20 years ago but today today I'm seeing a lot of people in your generation upwardly mobile if we can call them that who have good education who have pretty decent jobs who who earn comparatively good uh, who earn good money they are the ones that are leaving too yeah i mean part of it is the the system here that you know there are certain limits to what you can do and unfortunately uh you people who have good education who are you know have good uh, they let's say they're programmers and they can see that programmers of the same uh quality make you know 10 times more money in the us or in europe and of course, they have this uh, very strong incentive to leave. Mm -hmm. So that's part of the problem. Another part of the problem is that, uh, you know, somehow they don't really see a beacon of hope. I mean, it sounds very uh, kind of, <laughs> you know, in bad style. But Depressing. they don't really see some kind of, you know, they, they say, yeah, this is bad, this is bad. But OK, we have this part of the society which can become the game changer. They don't really see that. So I think it would, it's uh, several years ago when the political situation was different and there was a strong political opposition. A lot of people, their, their lives were hard, but they still had some hopes. They were thinking, okay, the government will change and maybe things will get better. And uh, every time people understand that the government will not change, there's a new wave of immigration. So, yeah. but, but then we have people like you, like Mikhail Zolian and many, many other people like you who are engaged, who are active, who, you know, just serving by example. And even though you talked earlier about limits in Armenia, there are so many endless opportunities, are there not? 
There are, but there actually, you know, uh, if you compare Armenia to, let's say, Georgia, which are, we have a very similar culture, very similar history, but in Georgia, uh, at least until recently, if you were young and educated, you could see that, you know, the future is wide open for you. Uh, in Armenia, yes, you can find something. And uh, for some people, if you are not very ambitious, that's enough for you. Or if you are very idealistic and optimistic and you think that there will be major changes in the future, right. which I think, because I don't think things can stay the same forever. And we that's see right. the world is changing, even if, you know, in Armenia inside the government or the system is, uh, they don't want to change, but they will have to change sooner or later. Mm -hmm. But uh, a lot of people, they just don't want to wait. While in Georgia, they may be making the same amount of money, but their position in the society is different. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they are much more respected. They, they feel that they are perceived as an example to be followed. Mm -hmm. While in Armenia, basically, it's, you know, the so-called oligarchs who are respected by everyone because they have so much power and they have so much money. And uh, I think that's, that's an issue. But in general, I think uh, we still have to get used to having our own country. Yeah. We didn't have our own country for ages. Centuries. The centuries. And uh, maybe that's why it's, things are different in Georgia. Because right. Georgians, right. even when they were occupied they by foreign powers, they still had yeah. a kind of semi-independent yeah. kingdom. So they identified more with a certain territory. Right. While for Armenians it was a church, but church is not linked to a territory. I mean, you could be Armenian in uh, India. India. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So uh, it takes time to change this kind of perception. Right. Um, and just on a final note, Mikhail, what would you like to see changing? I mean, again, these are very broad questions, but sometimes we have to ask the big questions then to somehow break it apart and see which component we're going to push forward. Um, but where's, what is going to be the game changer in Armenia? Well, there can be several game changers. So. Uh and some of them don't depend on us, you know, geopolitical changes, which will happen sooner or later. But I think what, what could change things a lot, if there was a wave of diasporans, both old diasporans from the West or Middle East, or you know, new diasporans from Russia and the former Soviet states, if there was a wave of people coming back, this could break this kind of cycle. Yeah, that, that it makes me happy to hear you say that. It makes me sad to know that 20 years on we don't have that many people coming back but I certainly hope that you people you know in the diaspora also they need to see people like you and this is why I'm so happy that you agreed uh, to be interviewed for this week's segment well, maybe, maybe of there are, people for us. Uh, really. Thank you maybe there are a few people coming back from diaspora but the changes that they make there and this park actually that we're yeah, in that's right. it's you know it's I, I'm optimistic. I'm That's trying good. To be well, thank on that you. happy note of optimism, thank you very much, Mikhail Zolian, uh, for meeting with us on this beautiful autumn day in Yerevan.